Now, oh, welcome everyone if you're just tuning in. Uh, so this is kind of a online study session. So uh, basically anything you guys want me to cover, I am happy to do that. So I just pop any questions in the chat uh, and I will go ahead and yeah, do anything from the seven topics. Welcome if you're just joining. Uh, I am, ah, Prem's algorithm is my first request. Okay, that's a good one. Uh, so uh, let me just find a question real quick. There is just a little bit of a lag in my, uh, uh, what do we call it, screen sharing app. So just give me a sec to find you a question. Doing some prims algorithm, otherwise known as the minimum spanning tree. Okay, so there are a few different options for these uh, but here's a good one okay let's see if i can get the share screen sharing working again All right, so I've had a request for Prim's algorithm. Let me just see if I can get this uh, screen to share properly. Hmm. Does seem to be a little bit of a lag. Hang on, I think I've got it now. That should work now. There we go. Okay, so just going to do some Prim's algorithm here. So Prim's algorithm is one of the ways that you can solve a minimum spanning tree problem. Okay, so uh, there are other algorithms, algorithms you can use as well, like Kruskal's algorithm is one. Uh, but Prim's algorithm, uh, you choose a place to start. So in this example I've just put here on the screen, we've got uh, a farm site, okay? So we've got a house, we've got uh, a workshop, a garage, a shed, we've got all these different sites and they all need to be powered, okay? And the power comes from the transformer here. We wanna find the cheapest way to do that, okay? So, what we would do is we, first of all, highlight a starting node. And it doesn't actually matter what node uh, you wanna start from. You should get the same answer no matter where you start from. Okay, so uh, you basically look at all the nodes that are one step away. So house is one step away, garage is one step away, the pump is one step away and we connect the closest node that is one step away, okay? So in this case, we've got either 400, 390, or 350. So the closest one would be the pump here, okay? So we've now got two nodes connected. That's the start of our tree, okay? So now I look at the other nodes that are still unconnected. So I've got a shed that one, one step away. I've got a garage that's one step away here and one step away here. And I've got the house that's one step away. So I wanna pick the closest unconnected node and connect it to the tree that I'm making here. Okay, so in this case, the closest one, I've got 400 here, 390, 350, 
150 or 250. So obviously this is going to be the closest connection. Okay, so I've still got some other options now. I've got the house is still unconnected, the workshop is still unconnected, and the shed is still unconnected. So I can uh, possibly, I've got a few ways that I could connect the house. I've got 400 here or 350 here or 250 here. I've got the workshop at 200 uh, or I've got the shed at 250 or 250 that way. Okay, so the closest unconnected node is going to be the workshop and I can connect it here. So I just have two more to uh, add to the tree. So I've got the house that I can either connect 200, 250, 350 or 400. And I've got the shed at 240, 250 or 250 over here. And it looks like I've got uh, just this one here that is the smallest, the 200 connection there. So I'm going to do that, okay? Now, remember, I am only connecting unconnected nodes. It's no point putting in any other paths once everything's connected. Okay, so my last unconnected node is the shed. So I am going to connect it here. Okay, and that is my minimum spanning tree all finished. Okay, so that would be the quickest way. Now, the main difference between a tree and a path, like the shortest path or the critical path, is that the tree can branch. So you can see if I look at sort of the, the tree here, you can see it branches off in one direction and it branches off in another direction. There's not a single path, okay? So that's how it's different. Uh, someone asked me if I'm a teacher or a student. Uh, I am a tutor, so that's all I'm gonna say for now. Uh, can I go over how to draw an activity network with dummy activities? How do I draw it? Yes, I can do that. Uh, someone asked, does it matter where I start? Uh, no, it doesn't. You can start at any node and you should get the same answer no matter where you start. Sometimes there's two possible solutions uh, because you've got two connections that are the same size, uh, but you should get the same answer no matter where you start from. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, the next question was, uh, did you want me to do another one of those minimal spanning trees or would you like me to move on to the critical path analysis with dummy activities? Let me know if you want me to do another minimal spanning tree or if we're happy with that. I'm just going to bring up a question with a dummy activity. Just blanking the screen while I'm doing that. Haven't left you or anything. Uh, yeah, uh, someone asked if I can save this. I'm going to do my best to save it. <laughs> I am for, like new to this kind of thing. So I will do my best to make sure that people can watch it later. Okay. So I found a question that I can do for a nice, easy dummy activity uh, question. All right, let me bring that up. 
There we go. So here's an activity table. And here's uh, the sort of thing that you'll notice uh, if you're looking for a question with a dummy activity. Okay, so see how this uh, B is highlighted here? If you've got a letter that goes across two rows like that, you can be fairly certain that it's going to be a dummy activity uh, is going to be needed. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can definitely do Hungarian algorithm as well. Okay, so uh, here we go. Let's uh, start drawing this one up. So this is how I do it. Lots of people do them in slightly different ways, but this is certainly how I do them. Start with a start node. Okay, and then I can see that there's three activities that have no immediate predecessor. Okay, so they can come, all three of those can happen straight away. Okay, and I'm going to call this one A, this one B, let me do that a bit neater, this one's B, and this one's C. Okay, I now look at my next row, and I can see that activity D needs to have both A and B as a predecessor, and E needs to have both B and C as a predecessor. Okay, so there's sort of, I need to almost split B into two. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw another node here, another node here, and another node here, and then I'm going to draw a dummy activity line from here to here. Oh, by the way, all of these should have arrows on them. I always forget to do that. Okay, and now you can see. I can make D and E happen like that. Okay? And this would be sort of my finish here. Okay. Uh, is that the sort of question that we were after? Would you like to do another one with a dummy activity and see if you can have a go? Uh, just let me know what you want to do in the chat. I'm at your disposal. Why don't I put up one more question? Yeah, let's do another one. Uh, and then we can move on to Hungarian algorithm. All right, so there's a question on the screen. I'm gonna wait a couple of minutes, give you guys a chance to do this question, and then I'll put the answer up on the screen. Okay. I see there's uh, another request for seasonal indices. We can definitely do that one as well. Uh, Hungarian algorithm is the next one though.
All right, maybe one more minute, okay, just to let people finish up and then I will go through the answer. Sorry, you hear me rustling around it's because I'm uh, looking for questions in my little book of resources here. Hopefully that's enough time for everyone to have attempted that question. Uh, so this is how I would do it. So I would start with a start node and I can see that there's two lines, two activities that don't have immediate predecessors. So I can just kind of draw them off like this. Like I said, everyone draws these slightly differently. So it's okay if they don't look exactly, you know, the same. Okay, then I look at my next uh, row here and I can see activity C has one predecessor that is activity A. So I'm gonna put a node here and put activity C there. Okay, now I can see activity D has B as a predecessor. So that means B comes just before D. Okay, hopefully you're all with me so far. Oh, don't forget to put arrows on these things. Okay. Now, here's the clue that there's something strange going on. Okay. And the clue is that C is across two rows. So we know C must be the one that uh, has a dummy activity involved. Okay. So I can see... F just needs C as a predecessor, but E needs both C and D as a predecessor, okay? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to make, make a node on here, I'll make a node here. F can just come straight off of C, like that, uh, but E, needs both C and D. So I'm going to draw a dummy line here and E needs to go there like that. Okay, and then I can see activity G needs both E and F as a predecessor. So I'm gonna join them back together and G will go there like that. Okay, how did we go? Hopefully we were successful at that. Okay, so my next request was Hungarian algorithm. So for that one, I might steal the question that was on the public sample. So just let me get that up.
Uh, so it was in the public sample paper two, and it's question five, if you happen to have it there, but I will project it on the screen. Just need to find it. Okay, we should be good now. Uh, I do seem to, I'm seeing a bit of a lag on the screen here. Let me know if it, it fits. Really. I don't really know how to fix it though, so fingers crossed. Okay, so here's a question that was on the uh, sample uh, paper, the publicly av available sample exam uh, and this is a Hungarian algorithm question okay it even says it in the question there okay so Hungarian algorithm is about allocating uh, jobs to people in the most efficient way possible okay so uh, we want to make sure that the job can be done as cheaply as possible so that's what we're going to do Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do is put the information that's in this table here into a matrix. Uh, now, the matrix uh, sort of form is, it's kind of just like a table, but it's a quicker way of writing one. And it is uh, essentially a really good uh, to use in computer programming. This is sort of how computers and humans can talk to each other. So essentially what I'm gonna do is shorten this table and just uh, simplify the information that's in there, okay? So I'm gonna do this. Okay, so there's my matrix. Essentially, what I've highlighted there is the matrix. Uh, now, the first thing I want to do is what's called a row reduction. So I have to look through each row and I wanna look for the smallest number in each row. And I wanna take that number away from the entire row. Okay, so the first row here, the smallest number, is 62, okay? So I am going to take away 62 from that whole row, you know, each of the numbers in that row. In the second row, 60 is my smallest number. So I'm gonna take away 60 from every number in that row. And then in the last row, 77 is the smallest number there. So I'm gonna take away 77 from everything. Okay, and then I'm gonna rewrite that underneath. Okay, so 196 take away 62 is 134. 62 take away 62 is zero. Uh, 203 take away 62 is 141. The next row, 150 take away 60 is 90. Uh, 60 take away 60 is zero, and 147 take away 60 is 87. And then the last row, 127 take away 77 is 50. Uh, 50 77 take away 77 is zero, and 111 take away 77 is 30. Four. Okay, so that was a row reduction. Okay, I'm reducing the row, each row by the smallest number in the row. Okay, so once I've done a row reduction, now I need to do a column reduction. Okay, 
So I look down each of the columns, okay, and I take away the smallest number from each number in the column, okay? So in the first column, the smallest number is going to be 50. So I'm going to take away 50 from every number in the column. And in, well, the middle column, they're all zero. So zero take away zero is zero. So I'm just going to leave that. And then in the third column, the smallest number is 34. So I'm going to take away 34 from every number in that column. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite that. So 134 take away 50 is going to be 84. Uh, 90 take away 50 is 40. And then 50 take away 50 is 0. My second column is going to stay the same. And then my third column, I'm taking away 34 from everything. So 141 take away 34 is 107. Uh, 87 take away 34 is 53. And then 34 take away 34 is 0. Okay. So the first step was to, well, first of all, I had to write it into a matrix. Then I had to do a row reduction where I took away each number, the smallest number from each row from the entire row. Then I did a column reduction where I take the smallest number in each column away from every number in that column. Now what I want to do is try and highlight all of the zeros in as few uh, lines as possible. Okay, so if I do that, that's one line. And if I do that, that's another line. Okay, so it only took me two lines to uh, highlight all the zeros. Okay, now I know I'm done with my Hungarian algorithm when I can highlight the zeros with the same number of lines as I have sort of people, okay? So if I have K, L, M, that's three people. So I need three lines. Right now I could do it with two, so I know I'm not done, okay? So the next phase, so recap, row reduction, column reduction, and then highlight. Then we need to do, I just call it the adjustment phase, okay? So what I need to do is find the smallest uncovered number. I'm just gonna write this here because it gets a bit tricky. Find the smallest uncovered number. Do you, by uncovered, I mean it's not highlighted. which in this case is 40. Here it is, the smallest uncovered number. And I'm going to take that away. Uh, from every uncovered number. And then I'm also going to add 40 to every number that's covered twice. Okay, so I want to take away 40 from every uncovered number and I want to add 40 to any number that's covered twice and I'm, by that I mean it's got highlighted lines through it twice 
Okay. So now I'm going to redraw that matrix. So let's just work systematically through that. So 84 take away 40 would be 44. Uh, that's still going to be zero. 107 take away 40 is 67. 40 take away 40 is zero. Uh, that's still zero there. 53 take away 40 is 13. Uh, that one's still zero. This is the uncovered, the covered twice. So that becomes 40. And then the last one's still zero. Okay, so now I'm going to do my highlighting trick again and see what is the smallest number of highlights I can, highlighted lines I can do. Okay, so I could do one here, I could do one here, but you can see this one's still not covered. Okay, let me try a different combination, one here, one here, now this one's left out, okay? So as you can see, I need at least three lines to cover all of my zeros. And three lines is equal to the number of rows. I have three rows and three lines. So now I know I can start allocating, okay? So, uh, a lot of the time we can do this with the bipartite graph, which is a special kind of graph that uh, uh, looks like this. Um, it's got two district, distinct groups, and they sort of cross over between those groups. So my first group over here is the person, uh, Kate, Luca, and Marcel. And then my second group are the, the jobs, build the bookcase, build the chair, build the desk, okay? Now, I'm looking for my zeros. So it looks like Kate uh, can do the chair. So let's join, draw a line between Kate and the chair. Uh, Luca can do the bookcase and the chair. So let's draw those in. And then Marcel can do the bookcase and the desk. Okay, so let's allocate these in the best possible way. So you can kind of see there, Kate can only do one job at the zero, okay? So Kate kind of has to do the chair, okay? Because as you can see, it's the only line that comes off of her node there, okay? So if Kate's doing the chair, Luca also can't, he can't do the chair now, okay? So if Kate's doing the chair, Lu that just leaves Luca to do the bookcase, okay? And now that Luca's doing the bookcase, Marcel must be doing the desk, okay? And that's our optimum allocation. Kate to do the chair, Luca to do the bookcase, and Marcel to do the desk. And that would leave us with a cost of, so Kate, Kate does the chair for $62. Luca does the bookcase for $150. I'm looking back at the table now. And Marcel does the desk for $111. And that is going to be the cheapest possible way of doing that if you add all those up. we get 323. So if you tried every single possible combination, 
this would always end up being the cheapest way to do it. So we call that the optimal allocation. Okay. So that's the Hungarian algorithm. Uh, would you like me to put one up for you to do maybe? On your own. Would everyone like to have a go at one? Or would you like me to move on to seasonal indices? Let me know if you want to have a go at one in, in the chat there. Or do you want to take that away and practice it maybe? Here's what I'll do. Okay, we're all happy. All right, let's do uh, seasonal indices then is the next one. Uh, so it was a good question. Once again, we'll use something from the, let's do one from the sample paper again. There was a good question on there. Let me just grab that one real quick. Uh, I tell a lie, it was the mock, not the sample. Okay, so here's a question that was on the mock. Let me just make it so it all fits on one page. Okay, so this was a question that was on the mock. Uh, and it gives you some data in a table, not a table, a graph, which is unusual. Usually they do give it to you in a table, and now it's in a graph. So uh, the first step you have to do is uh, translate this data from a graph into a table. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to make this quite small so I can sort of fit my table on here. Hopefully you can all still see. And if not, hopefully you all have your mocks with you so you can uh, look at the actual question. Okay, so I'm going to put this into a table. Uh, so I'm going to put the years on the side and I'm going to put the uh, seasons across the top. You don't have to do it this way, but I think this is the best way to do it personally. But bear in mind, there are different ways to approach these kinds of questions. Okay, so here's my table. And the first thing I'm doing is just translating the information from the graph into the table.
Okay, so that's me turning the information from a graph into a table. All right, so uh, the seasonal index is the actual value uh, divided by the yearly average. So that means first thing you need to do is get that yearly average. Okay, so to do that, you need to add up all the numbers from 2017 and divide by four, because there's four of them. Then you need to do the same for 2018. Add the numbers all together, divide by four. Okay, so get yourself a yearly average. Okay, so the yearly average for 2017 should be 6,000 and the yearly average for 2018 should be 900, 9,000, sorry. Uh, so 6,000 is the average for 2017 and 9,000 is the yearly average for 2018, okay? So now I need to calculate the seasonal index for each of these data points. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna redraw this table as a seasonal index table, okay? Okay, so the seasonal index for summer 20, 2017 is going to be uh, 1, 000, 10 thousand divided by the yearly average, which is six thousand. Okay, and you pop that into your calculator, and you get one point six seven. Uh, now I'm just rounding that to two decimal places. Okay, uh, it. The question does not specify, so I'm just going to do kind of the default, which is two decimal places, but I'm fairly sure QCAA will accept uh, different roundings as long as they sort of are logically consistent and make sense. Okay, so I'm just gonna work through the whole table doing the same thing. 9,000 divided by 6,000 is 1.5. And then 1,000 divided by 6,000, 0.17. 4,000 divided by 6,000, 0.17. All right, now I'm moving on to 2018. And so I'm now going to divide by 2018's yearly average, not 2017. Okay, so there's uh, my table so far. Now, 
things that you should notice is numbers that are below the yearly average, like winter here is far below average. You can see that on the graph. So you'll see that it has a seasonal index that's less than one. Whereas a number that's well above average will have a number that's greater than one. So that sort of clues you in and lets you know that you're doing the right thing. Because if you forget, maybe you forget whether you need to multiply or divide and which one goes on top. Well, that's how you can kind of figure it out. If the number is below average, you're going to end up with a small number that's less than one. If the sales are above average, then you're going to end up with a number much bigger than one. Okay. So sort of hopefully that'll be a cue for you when you are in the exam. All right. Now the null index for both years, okay, we can now come up with an overall seasonal index for each season. So uh, summer, for example, very easy because they both agree with each other, but some of the others don't. So we need to get the average for all of summer, the average for all of winter, average for all of winter, sorry, autumn, winter, and then spring. So we're going to average downwards, okay? So that one's easy because they're both the same. Uh, so you do uh, 1.5 plus 1.44 and then divide by 2. And I get 1.47. Okay. Winter, 0 0.17 plus 0 0.22. Divide by 2 and I get 0 0.20. Let's double check that that's right because I think I've written something weird here. If you think I've done something wrong, do let me know. Yeah, so that one rounds to three decimal places um, nicely, but I'm going to stick to my pattern here and round it to two decimal places. Okay. And then the last one's nice and easy because they're both the same. Ah, someone wants to know what do I do if they don't give me winter's value and I have to work backwards. So let's say I've been told uh, that, well, they have to give you some kind of information. They either have to give you the deseasonalized number or they'd have to give you the yearly average and the seasonal index. They'd have to give you some combination. And in that case, you just work backwards from what we've just done. Okay. Uh, let me just figure out the deseasonalized figure and then I will show you what you can do backwards. Okay. So now that we have the seasonal index, we now need to deseasonalize. Okay. So I'm going to make another table. Okay. So we have three tables going here. We had the actual values. We had the seasonal index table, and now we've got the deseasonalized table happening here. It's a bit of a journey, this topic. I wouldn't call this one particularly hard, um, but it's just confusing because there's a lot going on. But if you just kind of follow the steps, you should get there eventually. Okay. So to de-seasonalize the data, once again, it is divide. Okay, so you're going to take uh, 10,000 from here and divide by summer's seasonal index. And that gives you 5.5. .5. 
5988.02. I can't fit it in my table properly. Hang on, let me fix that. That's going to bother me. Okay. Summer 2018 would be 15000, also divided by 1.67 because that's this average seasonal index. And I get oops, 8982.04. Okay, now autumn. I'm going to take the 2017 actual value for autumn and I'm going to divide it by the seasonal index for autumn. And that's the average seasonal index, not the individual seasonal index. Otherwise, you're just going to kind of go backwards. And that gives me like that. And then 2018. Winter would be 1,000 divided by this one here. That gives me 5,000 like that. And winter 2018 is 2,000 divided by 0 0.2i. So you see what deseasonalizing does is it brings things kind of back into balance. It takes the bigger numbers that are above average and makes them smaller. It takes the smaller numbers that are below average and makes them bigger. So it's, it's a way of smoothing the data. Okay. So now we just have to do spring. Zero point six seven. What's this? And then the other one was six thousand. Okay. So to answer a question before about going backwards, maybe they might say, uh, what if a spring value, what, oh, I actually changed my winter. So if you had a winter deseasonalized value of 5,000, and the seasonal index was 0 0.20, uh, what was the original value, okay? And then in that case, you just have to go backwards. If uh, it's normally the actual value divided by the seasonal index gives you the deseasonalized, well, all you have to do is go backwards. So the actual value would be, 5,000 times, oh no, other way around. Hang on. Yeah, no, that's right. Second guessing myself here. That puts you back to 1,000. Okay, so it's just kind of working backwards. Instead of dividing, you'd be multiplying. Okay. Um, 
I haven't really seen any that ask you to work backwards. I've only seen ones that get you to de-seasonalize. Uh, sometimes they give you the seasonal indices already. Um, Sometimes they, um, the next step would then be to, in this question, they don't ask you to do this, but in other questions I've seen them where they want you to make a prediction for the future. So if they want you to make a prediction, what you would then have to do is treat this like it's bivariate data, like it's data on a scatter plot, okay? And you would enter it into your calculator and come up with the least squares line, okay? which is sort of that y equals mx plus c, but um, I think they do it a plus bx in bivariate data analysis. Yeah. So you would just put all this data into your calculator. You would make each of these a number. So that would be 1, that would be 2, 3, 4, five, six, seven, eight, like that. And you'd make the numbers in green would be your X variable. And then the numbers in the table would be the Y variable. Popple that into your calculator and get your values for A and B. And then you can start making predictions into the future. Okay. So that's calculating seasonal indices. Do we have any further questions on that topic? Because I've had uh, another request for reducing balance loans and recurrence relations. So if you have any more questions about seasonal indices or de-seasonalizing or anything like that, now's your chance to ask before I move on to another topic. Uh, Abby, hopefully that answered your question about seasonal indices, but let me know. All good. Great. Okay. Let's go on to reducing balance loans and um, recursion. Okay. So I'm just going to bring up uh, a question. Uh, I did make uh, a video uh, on this same YouTube channel where I... Uh, kind of went through that whole topic of annuities and I did actually show a little bit of the recurrence relation stuff in that video um, so you can definitely go back and have a look at that I know it's uh, a long video but uh, it kind of covers like everything in that topic except for like one or two things and if you think about it that's like a it's like let me see. I'm looking here. That's 14 hours of syllabus content, content in 43 minutes. So I think I did pretty well, even though it is a bit long. So I would highly recommend having a look at that video because I go through uh, things with a recurrence relation and I, um, I even show it to you on a spreadsheet so you can see what it looks like uh, all uh, kind of sorted. But let me grab a recurrence relation question from a mock or sample. Ah, here's one. Let's do that. Okay, so the question I've got up on the screen right now is uh, the one and only <laughs> question using um, reducing balance loan and recursion that I found in the mock and sample. Okay, so uh, let's talk through this one. 
but then I might show you one one other kind. Okay, so we've got a personal loan of three hundred and fifty dollars, uh, and they make a payment of sixty dollars every month, uh, but also interest is being added. Okay. So here's the recurrence relation that shows what's going on. Okay, so let me just kind of rewrite this. So how I think of this, I think of AN plus 1 as the next term and AN as the current term, okay? So I read this as to find the next term, you take the current term and you multiply by this interest here, this interest rate here, and then you take away $60, okay? $60 is obviously the repayment. And this is the interest. Okay, uh, so what it means is if my starting value, if my A0, my starting value is $350, uh, I can use recursion to find the balance after two months. Okay, so my starting, my A0 is 350. So my next term would be A1, so that's the value of the investment after one month. So what I would do is I would substitute 350 into here. And then take away the $60 repayment. Okay, I really don't need that dollar sign there. Okay, put that into your calculator and you get $298.505, like that, okay? But now we need the second month because it's after two months. So A2 would be, I've just got to carry down the previous term. That's what recursion means. Recurrence, um, recursion means to repeat the calculation over and over again. So I am taking my answer from the previous term and I'm carrying it down to continue that calculation. So at the end of the second month, I have a value of $245.76, which you can see is option. C. Okay. So that's what you can do if you've been given a recurrence relation and you want to solve the problem. Um, but you probably want to know how to write a recurrence relation, I'm guessing. So let me just make up a question for you here. So. Let's say we had a loan, that's M, a loan uh, of $20,000, okay? Our interest rate is 3%. Per annum, uh, but it's compounding monthly. Like that. Okay. Uh, and we have a repayment of, let's say, uh, $150 per month. That's your variables there, okay? 
So we're repaying $150 per month. We start with a loan of $20,000 and we've got an interest rate of 3% per annum compounding monthly. Okay, so we think of our recurrence relation and I think the formula on the formula sheet, I think looks something like this. I think it looks like that. That's a capital R. From memory. Now, the lowercase r is the common ratio, and it's to do with our interest rate, and r is our repayment. Okay, so let's work that out. So r is basically going to be one plus i, i that you would normally calculate in a compounding interest loan situation okay uh, now if you're wondering why do I add one to it it's because uh, you want to increase by that interest rate okay so you have to add the interest rate to one one would rep represent a hundred percent and if you multiply by a hundred percent it stays the same so you want to know increasing by that amount. So that's gonna be one plus, but then it's 3% compounding monthly, like that. That's our lowercase r. And then capital R is our repayment of $150. So we would write this as the next term, AN plus one is the next term. Come on, pen. Our common ratio times the current term, take away our regular repayment with a starting value of 20,000. Okay, that's how you would write a recurrence relation. So this is an example of that previous question that I showed you, is an example of what you would do if you're given a recurrence relation, you just substitute it in, and the second question I just showed you that I made up is how you would write the recurrence relation if you were given some information. Okay. So hopefully that answers questions about that topic. Uh, so I've run out of requests now. So if anyone's got something they'd like me to do, now's the time. You've got a particular question you want me to go through or a particular topic. Any requests, pop them into the chat. Ah, maximum flow, good choice. All right, let me bring up a question and we will do max flow min cut. Uh, the thing I like about the... Um, uh, uh, oh, some geometry as well. Yeah, we can definitely manage that. Um, the thing I like about the network stuff is once you get used to them, they're not actually that hard per se. I know that probably sounds a little demoralizing to say that, but um, it's like it's the terminology and knowing what to do that is the hard part. But the maths itself can actually be... Uh, more like a puzzle than anything else. Uh, flow networks, that's what I want.
All righty, let's have a look at this question. So, maximum flow, minimum cut should be equal to each other. That's the that's how the rule goes. Okay. Uh, so uh, there's basically two different processes. So you can do the max flow kind of process and get an answer, and then you can do the min cut process. Okay. Now you can go straight to the min cut, which is the easier way to do it. But unfortunately, with min cut, you can only find it through trial and error which may be something that you like, but I personally cannot stand using trial and error because I always worry, like, how do I know that I've actually found the, the correct answer if I'm just using trial and error? So what I like to do is both and just make sure that they are both equal to each other. Okay, so that's how I like to do it. All right, so I'm going to start with max flow and then I'll show you the min cut. Okay, so the max flow, you start at your source, which is where all the water is coming from, and you are heading towards your sink, which is where all the water is going to. So often we use S to symbolize source and T to symbolize sink, presumably because S was already taken. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to work my way from the source to the sink and I'm just going to try and allocate the water as best I can, okay? But remember, there's going to be limitations, okay? So if I look at this bottom pathway here, I've got, say, 11 litres coming through this pipe, okay? But then it joins on to these two pipes here but you can see I can only send three litres down one pipe and one litre down the other pipe. So if I try and send all 11 litres down that first pipe, I'm going to end up overflowing the system. So that means I can't send 11 down there. I have to only send four, okay, which means one litre is going that way and three litres going that way. Okay, so I'm going to send four litres down, three in one path, one down the other path. Okay, now uh, along the top row so far, this one here, I've got eight, and you can see I've actually only got one outflow here. I've only got three outflow. Okay, now that means I can't send all eight down that uh, pipe because it's going to overflow again. So that means I can only send three litres down, not eight, okay? Uh, so I'm going to send all three of those litres down that pipe. Now you can see I've got this other inflow here. So that's, that's two of them sort of coming off this pipe here that only has three litres coming through it. Now, there's no point in me sending any water back up through that pipe from B to A. There's no point because I'm already at maximum capacity afterwards. So I'm not going to send any water. That's a zero. I'm not going to send any water from B to A. I'm just going to turn that whole pipe off. And I'm going to send all the water from B to T which means even though I have a capacity, the potential capacity of five, I can only send three. So you can see by the time I get to the sink, which is T, I'm actually only sending seven liters of water down the end. Three plus three plus one, okay? So that is my max flow. The maximum amount of flow that I can send through this network is seven, okay? So now you want to look for the minimum cut, okay? So a cut is basically 
a line through the network that cuts it in half. It cuts the source, in, uh, separates the source from the sink. Okay. Now, the capacity of that cut is the sum of all of the edges that it has crossed. Okay, so the capacity of the cut I just made would be 3 plus 5 plus 1. Okay, now that's not the minimum cut I can make. Okay, uh, it must be smaller than that. So that is a cut, but it's not the minimum cut. I want to find the smallest one. Okay, and if you're doing my special method here, the best way to find it is to look for the double numbers okay the ones that haven't been crossed out okay and i want to try and cut those lines like that so that would be three plus three plus one now you're probably wondering why i didn't add this five in here but if you notice, the pipe is flowing in the wrong direction. So I'm only counting the lines that go from source to sink. Source to sink this way, source to sink this way. If you can see, the other one goes from sink to source. Okay, so I'm not going to count uh, that five. Uh, pipe there that five edge okay so you can see that minimum cut is equal to my maximum flow okay now you could have very easily solved this problem by just using trial and error and you know finding your way to seven you are welcome to do that but uh that's not something i like doing because i like to be doubly sure that i've done that okay now, there's only one question on of this on the QCAA mock, so I'll show it to you real quick. Just making it fit the screen, sorry. Give me one sec. So there you go. That is the one and only flow question that was on either the mock or the public sample okay so why don't you have a go at calculating the capacity of that cut and tell me what you think it is or write it down and then i'll tell you what it is Okay, so you can see that cut crosses over that line, that line, that line, and that line, but there's one that we don't include. Okay, so you can see this one here goes source to sink, so that's good. Uh, but 80 here goes sink to source, so don't include that one, but include the other two. So 50 goes sink to source, sorry, source to sink, and 
uh, 40 goes source to sink as well. So it's going to be 40 plus 50 plus 70. Do not include the 80. That gives us a capacity of 160, which is A. Uh, so let me know, would you like me to get you one more flow question for you to have a go at or for me to demonstrate? Or do we want to move on to some earth geometry, latitude and longitude? Let me know, are we happy with that? Or one more? All right, let's go on and do some earth geometry then. Oh, someone else wants one more. Let's just do one more and we'll make it nice and quick and then we'll go on to uh, earth geometry because I think, I think we could do one more. No, never going to hurt you to do more practice, is it? <laughs> Okay, this one comes from the sample IA3, which is on the QCAA website. Okay, uh, so I won't get you to answer the full question, which is the how long it will take thing. All I want you to do is calculate the max flow and or the min cut, whatever you think is best. I'll do both. Okay, so I'll give you maybe two minutes. Have a go. Let's see what you can do. Okay, maybe give you one more minute to get that done and then I'll start working through the answer. All right, I'm going to make a start. Okay, so I'm looking at my allocations. I've got 500 that can go through here. Uh, but you can see it's uh, even though I have the capacity here for 750, uh, I can only send 500 because that's all I've got coming in. 500, and that's going to be 500. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to be able to take the whole capacity there. 
Okay. Uh, coming down the bottom here, I can put a thousand out, but you can see it splits into 500 and 250. So that means I can only send 750. That looks like a two. Let me try that again. 750 that way. Okay. And then that'll be 500 and that'll be. 250 okay now this middle node's kind of the problem i've got 3250 coming in but i've only got 2750 available to come out between those two pipes there so i've got 1000 here 1750 here uh, so that's only 2750 coming out okay uh, so that means this can only be 2,500 there, okay? Uh, and that now together equals what we want. Like that. And then you can see going from E to F, I've got 1,500 coming into E, so I can only have 1,500 coming out of E going into F, okay? So that means I have a total of 3,750. That's my max flow. Now, if you did the min cut method, it would look like that. That would be the min cut there. Okay. How did we go? Hopefully, you did one or the other or both and got that capacity. All right, let's do some earth geometry then. Great, that's excellent. Uh, let me disconnect and I'll find some earth geometry questions for us to do. Uh, we want some latitude and longitude. Uh, so uh, looking at geometry and latitude and longitude, do you want like, calculating distances or do you want uh finding the latitude and longitude on a map or uh what would you like for that one uh if you want to be a little bit more specific Which one do we want? Whichever. Okay, let's do. Let's do a bit of each, hey? I'll grab a selection here. That looks like a good one. Alrighty. righty. 
got four questions here for you. All right, here's the first question we're going to look at. Uh, you have to identify the town that is closest to the coordinates 28 degrees south and 115 degrees east. Okay, so why don't you have a go at that while I'm getting my notebook out. All right, so I'm going to start with my latitude. Latitudes are lines that run flat. Flat is flat, is everyone's favorite saying. So I can see 28 is going to be somewhere between 24 and 32. Okay, so, uh, but I'm missing some increments there, aren't I? Okay, so there should be eight increments in between so what i'm going to do is sort of start dividing them okay so sort of that would be halfway ish Does that work hopefully so that would be 24 25 26 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. Does that kind of make sense? I'm just kind of splitting it into subdivisions like that, okay? So, like, you're going to have to try and, you know, use your eye the best you can. But basically, 28 is halfway between 24 and 32. So you should be sort of aiming for halfway like that, okay? Let me try that again. That was so shaky. Ugh. Okay, you get what I'm trying to do there. <laughs> okay. And then the next one is 115 degrees east. Okay. And you can see 115 degrees would be between 114 and 120. Okay. And if I divide that as up, that's going to be, there's sort of six between 114 and 120. So I'm sort of gonna try and divide it into thirds. Cause that would be 115, 116, 17, 18, 19, 20. That works out. So I'm sort of looking on, going, I'm looking on kind of this line and this line kind of meet up there. So your answer is D. Okay. All right. So that's one sort of example that you'll see where you're given uh, the latitude and longitude and you have to find the place. The next uh, kind of example you'll see is where you are given a map and a location and you have to state the latitude and longitude of that location okay so they want you to state the latitude and longitude of Cuba PD which is there right in the middle okay so give that a go start with the latitude start dividing things up and then do the same with the longitude So I'm kind of looking at, here's 20 and 40, so halfway must be 30. So kind of there looks like about halfway. I'm just kind of eyeballing it. Okay. Uh, but that looks a bit too low for 
Kubipedi there. So halfway between, so that if that's 30, halfway again would be 25. Oops, hang on. Like that would be 25. So if you can kind of line that up, obviously you'll have a ruler. You can see that that's, uh, that to me is 28 because it's a little bit closer than halfway between 25 and 30. So we would say that's 28 degrees south. Now, if you did 27 or 29, that would also be accepted. There's a plus or minus one degree allowance in this one because, you know, as you can see, it's quite hard to get it exactly right. Okay, so now I'm doing the longitude. So I'm going to sort of look at about halfway, must be 130 there. And then sort of halfway again would be 135. And that actually looks kind of bang on. Oopsie. Okay, so that's your latitude and longitude. Once again, if you put 134 or 136, you would also get that correct. So there's a plus or minus one degree allowance there. Okay, so uh, just make sure you've always got your latitude first, then your longitude. There needs to be a comma between them, and I like to put brackets around them as well, but um, I think they accept it without brackets. Uh, so it should always be a north south first, and then an east or west second. Okay, let's have a look at distances now. So I've got two questions there, and we're looking for, oh, does latitude always go first? When, yes, latitude always goes first. So the north or the south first, and then the east or the west. Absolutely. Okay. So here's two different distance questions. They both want you to calculate the distance between two points. In the first example, you'll notice they have the same longitude, okay? Longitude is the same, the latitudes are different, okay? In the second question, it's the other way around. The latitudes are the same and the longitudes are different, okay? So you have to use a different formula for each of these kinds of questions, okay? So when you have the same longitude, uh, it means that if I draw a quick globe here, that these two points, oh, let's try that again. These two points are on the same line and that, well, oh, hang on. These two points are on the same line. That line is 144 degrees 21. So they're both on the same line there. Now, one of them is in the north and one of them is on the south, but they're both in the same line of longitude there. If I draw out the second one, they're on the same line of latitude. That globe is looking very flat. Let me try that again. They're on the same line of latitude, which is 37.6 degrees. Sometimes you see them with decimals. Sometimes you see them with degrees and minutes. Uh, but they are on, so these two are on the same line of latitude, but they're in different places on that line of latitude, okay? So you need different formulas for different situations, okay? For ones with the same longitude, you use this formula here. 
the distance equals 111.2 times the angular distance. And for the same latitude, you use the other formula. These are both on your formula sheet. Okay. Now, the angular distance is the distance between the two angles. Okay. So if this one up the top is, oh, my pen's not working. Hmm. Hang on. I think it ran out of batteries. That's all right. I'll just plug it back in and then we'll be back in business. There we go. We are back in business. So one of those points is in the north and the other. Oh, my goodness. What is wrong with you? Is in the south. I don't think my computer is enjoying the streaming as much as I am, clearly. Oh, no, I just. There we go, we're back. Okay, so you can see there is an angle distance between those two spots, okay? Uh, so because they are in different hemispheres, we need to add. That's because the equator is zero and this southern one is 38 degrees below and the other one is 48 degrees above. So that's a total distance uh, if you add them, okay? So that means I need to find 111.2 times 81 degrees and 10 minutes, okay? Uh, I'm adding them. If your latitudes are in the same hemisphere, you need to take away to find the angular distance between them. So different hemispheres add, the same hemisphere subtract is how I remember it. Okay. Uh, you can put that into your calculator just like that. Uh, but if you don't know how to use the angle function, you can always put it into your calculator as. 81 and 10 over 60 because there's 10 that's 10 minutes of out of 60 okay but i would highly recommend figuring out how to use your calculator to do that uh, and so to the nearest kilometer your answer is 9026 kilometers that's rounded Okay, so that's the first one. The second one, on the same latitude, once again, you need the angular distance. So you've got, uh, say, South Korea over here is 127 degrees east. Okay, uh, there's your, instead of the equator, it's the prime meridian. Uh, and then on this side of the globe, not to scale, is 122.4 degrees west, okay? Once again, we need the angular distance between them and we need to add because they are in different hemispheres, okay? Uh, so we add them together and we get 122.4 plus 127, okay? So, I'm just going to do off to the side here. 
the angular distance, if we add them together, 122.4 plus 127 is 249.4 degrees. Okay. Now, you might notice that number is greater than 180. Okay. Uh, and the question wants us to find the shortest distance. Now, if you go, uh, if you think about one full circle is 360 degrees, if you're going an angular distance that's greater than 180, you're going the long way round. Okay, so if you think about going around a circle, there's a short way and a long way, you want to go the short way. Anything greater than 180 is going to be the long way. So we want the short way. So the short angular distance is going to be 360 take away what we've got because there's 360 degrees in a full circle. We get 11. One, 0 0.6 degrees. So that's going to be the shorter way, which is what we want. Okay. Now I can substitute all that into my formula. So that's 111.2 times cos theta is the latitude. Boop, or oh, boop, that's quicker. I think that I think your calculators put that in with a bracket. Pop all that into your calculator, and you get. Hang on. We also want the nearest kilometer. So if I round that to the nearest kilometer, I get nine seven four four kilometers is my final answer there okay so two different distance questions two different formulas if they're the same longitude then you use the normal formula if they're the same latitude then you need the formula that has cos in it if they're in the same hemisphere subtract if they're in different hemispheres add make sure you're going the shortest way. That's kind of summing all that up. Okay. Uh, and that's got us nearly at nine o'clock. So I might uh, call it there. So if you've got any sort of last minute quick clarifications from what we've done today, no worries. It's a pleasure. Uh, I might see if, if people are interested, I will happily do this again tomorrow night at about the same time. So yeah, just let me know if you're interested. I'll post the link on the Facebook page again, because that just seems to be a really easy way to communicate with everyone. Uh, no problem, everyone. I'm very happy to help out. Uh, I'll put a Facebook post in there again, reminding everyone tomorrow that I'm going to do it. If you've got some requests, you can pop them in the comments. Yep, okay. If people are interested, then I'm very happy to do it again tomorrow night, same time. Let's just keep things easy and go 7 o'clock on this same channel. And I will post the link in uh, the Facebook page. But you're also welcome to subscribe and ring the bell. Oh, my gosh, I sound like a real YouTuber. Very exciting. And hopefully, if I can figure out how to do it, I'll make sure this gets uploaded to the channel so people can go back and have a look at things if they weren't sure. Okay? All right. Good night, everyone. Have a good rest. And uh, I will see you tomorrow, if you, uh, tomorrow night if you come to that. All right. Let me see if I can turn this off.